brothers here. Today I'll be looking at the recrystallization of sodium hydroxide, but before I actually get into the experiment, I want to go over the process of recrystallization, how it's carried out, and what it's actually used for. The process of recrystallization can be shown quite clearly in this diagram I got from the internet. The point of recrystallization is to purify an impure solid, which is usually a salt, because they're highly soluble in a lot of solvents, but you can recrystallize a wide range of compounds. As you can see, the impurities are denoted in the first picture by the ovals, while your desired compound is denoted by the squares. The process begins with the sample being dissolved in the appropriate solvent. In my case, in this experiment, water was used, but different solvents will be used for different compounds. Then the impure solute is dissolved by adding some energy to the system in the form of heat, which basically means just heating up your solvent with your solute dissolved in it. This heat helps to complete a dissolution reaction, where the impure solid dissociates into its impurities, or the impurities, and the desired compound. Once the solution is heated enough, so the solid is completely dissolved, it can then be cooled slowly. When the solution cools, the desired compound will crash out of solution, leaving the impurities behind. As you can see in the fourth picture, the impurities are now separate from your desired compound. As said, the objective was to recrystallize sodium hydroxide. This Diggers brand Corsic soda was used, which was purchased from a local hardware shop. It is usually used for unblocking drains. However, it said it contained 98% sodium hydroxide on the side label, which is still very pure. However, it can cause miscalculations sometimes when making solutions and etc. And a higher purity was desired. Five tablespoons of sodium hydroxide were added to a mortar. The quantity used was measured in tablespoons, which is very inaccurate, and a scale should be used. The reason a scale was not used in this experiment is because it recently ran out of battery. The sodium hydroxide came in a small spherical bead form which was crushed into a white powder as you can see in the picture. This helps for the dissolution of sodium hydroxide, however it is already highly soluble and I'm not sure if this step is necessary. Next, the sodium hydroxide was poured into a 1000ml round bottom boiling flask using a funnel as you can see. You can see the flask is placed in a heating mantle. This is not to begin the heating yet, but to hold the flask as it will not stand on a flat table. Following, 100 mils of water was added to the mortar to collect any leftover sodium hydroxide remaining. The mortar was lightly rocked to achieve this. The water was then poured from the mortar into the flask via a funnel. As you can see, light gloves were worn as I'm handling a highly corrosive solution. However, you can see that my arms are exposed, which is not very wise, and they should be covered as well. The flask was then added to a water bath, as the dissolution of sodium hydroxide is highly exothermic and should definitely not be allowed to get out of control. However, do not place the flask in water too cold or an ice bath, as the flask still needs to remain moderately warm to help dissolve the sodium hydroxide. 100 more mils of water was added to the flask, and in total, 200 mils of water were added. Following, as you can see, the flask was gently shaken to mix the solution and then it was placed in cool water to help control the temperature. This was done several times. As you can see, I'm touching around the bottom of the flask to get an idea of what the temperature is at. It was very hot. The flask was then placed in the water bath permanently for a small amount of time to reduce the temperature a little bit before heating. After cooling, the flask was then placed back on the heating mantle and the temperature was set on medium. As you can see, I'm using a plastic chopstick to mix the solution, which is not very professional. However, I did not need it, and it worked well for mixing. If you have a stir bar on hand, it will be much more efficient. As you can see, I'm occasionally feeling the bottom of the flask to check the temperature. It was very hot. This is a boiling flask, and it should be able to withstand the heat. However, I did not want the heat generated by the heating mantle and the dissolution of sodium hydroxide to become high enough that it actually would vaporize the water. Next, the hot solution was gravity filtered into a 300ml beaker using a low quality and possibly damaging filter paper. During the recrystallization process, a filtration step is not always necessary. However, since sodium hydroxide is highly soluble in water, it was thought that the less soluble and insoluble impurities would be partially removed. This step was only performed because of the following reason. If you wish to perform a filtration before recrystallizing your compound, then it is advised to lightly soak both your filter paper and receiving vessel in hot solvent. 
This is to prevent the early recrystallization of compounds on the filter paper or in the receiving vessel. To complete the gravity filtration, I just kept topping up the filter paper until enough had gone through so I could fill it up again until there was no solution left in the flask. However, during the decanting of the sodium hydroxide solution, I accidentally got some on my gloves, which if I had got on my skin, it would painfully burn. After the solution was completely poured into the beaker, the flask was allowed to rest and the beaker was allowed to cool to room temperature. Whilst the beaker was cooling, an interesting observation was made about the boiling flask. I will skip the rest of the pouring into the beaker because it is pretty straightforward. This is what the boiling flask looked like after it was allowed to cool. Note that the white crust seen is on the exterior of the flask, meaning it had nothing to do with insoluble impurities or undissolved sodium hydroxide. I don't know for certain what this white layer is, however, I suspect that the sodium hydroxide I accidentally spilt on my gloves corroded the gloves and then through cooling somewhat condensed and caked on the face of the flask. From this angle you can see that the white crust is primarily on one side of the flask, which I'll assume is the side I was holding mostly. While the solution was cooling I decided to take a pH test. While it is quite obvious the solution is very basic, I decided to carry one out anyway. As you can see I have changed the gloves I am wearing to a more protective thick pair as the solution evidently corrodes thin gloves very viciously. As you can see, the color blue indicates it's very basic. Once the solution was cooled to room temperature, it was placed in a cool water bath. It's very important, whilst performing a recrystallization, to cool the solution gradually and slowly. Cooling the solution too fast will result in impurities in your final compound and the highest purity will not be achieved. The water bath was topped up with more water to submerge the beaker further and therefore cool the solution evenly. It is very important whilst performing a recrystallization that the concentration of the solute wanting to be purified is very high in solution. Therefore there should be either a high amount of solute dissolved in the solvent or a minimum amount of solvent used. Once I placed the sodium hydroxide solution in the water bath it was soon realized that the sodium hydroxide concentration would not be high enough to induce recrystallization as sodium hydroxide has a very high solubility and 5 tablespoons for 200 mL of water was not concentrated enough. For this reason, the cooling was immediately stopped and instead placed in a heating mantle. The solution was then gradually brought to a boil. This was done to evaporate as much water as possible, leaving behind a much more concentrated sodium hydroxide solution. Here I also show the fumes evaporating from the flask. I do not show it here, but an Erlenmeyer flask was placed directly above the boiling flask, which caught some vapour which instantly condensed. This condensed liquid was tested for pH, and unsurprisingly the pH was very high. Therefore, I advise against inhaling the fumes. After boiling, the more concentrated solution of sodium hydroxide was transferred to a beaker, then allowed to cool to room temperature like previously. It was then placed in a cool water bath. After a while, it was seen that crystals were forming in the beaker. By the time crystals were seen forming in the beaker, the solution had turned to a translucent gloop. This gloop, already being cooled, was placed in the freezer to try and induce the gloop to fully crystallise. While the sodium hydroxide solution was further crystallizing, I quickly prepared to recrystallize a sample of copper sulfate which was also purchased at a local hardware store. This was to show another example of the crystals produced from recrystallization. You can see the copper sulfate in solution. Copper sulfate is famous for its nice blue color. After the copper sulfate solution was heated and stirred thoroughly, it was allowed to cool to let crystals precipitate. Now back to the sodium hydroxide solution. This is what the sodium hydroxide looked like after it was taken out of the freezer, let to sit for a while, and then scraped from the beaker. Note, this is not the full amount of sodium hydroxide obtained. Even though most of the gloop was water, the yield was much higher than shown here. You can see that nice white crystals were obtained. The purity of the product is usually tested through some type of spectroscopy, however I obviously don't have such equipment and had to assume the purity was higher than 98%. Here is a closer look at the crystals. Even though the experiment seemed to be a success, if one was to try and replicate it, they should use quantities measured in weight. This will allow them to calculate a final percent yield and help the experiment run smoother. This video was intended more to show the process of recrystallization 
rather than to effectively purify sodium hydroxide. After the crystals were allowed to dry, they were then transferred to a small beaker labelled sodium hydroxide purity above 98%. As said previously, it wasn't known exactly how pure the sample is, but it was assumed it is higher than 98%, which was the original purity. The sample was later transferred to another vessel for storage. Here you can see the final copper sulfate crystals. They have maintained their nice dark blue colour. This is a closer look at the copper sulfate crystals. As you can see, they have a nice twinkling appearance. An individual crystal was held closer to the camera. From this view, you can see the rigid yet aesthetic texture of the crystal, which kind of reminded me of something.